So the last video in this series, we looked at the original Armalite rifles produced by the Armalite company in our AR-15 family tree. There we looked at three main rifles, the AR-10, the AR-15, and the AR-18. However, the AR-15 we know today really wasn't in existence for too long under Armalite. Rather, in 1959, the rights to the AR-15 were sold to Colt, and it is at this time that the rifle we know today really comes into existence. In this video, we will be looking at the family tree of the AR-15 full-length rifles produced by Colt and adopted by the US military as the M16 family of rifles. If you're new here, this is the second video in a series I'm doing looking at the family tree of the AR-15. In the previous video, which you can watch here, we looked at the history of Armalite and their early creation of the AR-15 and also outlined the criteria for this family tree, so go watch that one if you haven't already. Videos after this are going to be looking at the AR-15 carbines, foreign variants of the rifle, and a final video just putting the whole family tree together. So remember to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and let's just get right into it. So the AR-15 as Armalite first developed it actually looks like this. You'll notice that it's actually quite similar to its larger caliber predecessor, the AR-10, and that they have some key similarities, namely the brown polymer furniture and the topside charging handle. But in 1959, Armalite sold the gun to Colt for reasons that we talked about in the last video, and they ended up changing it up a lot and making it much more like the gun we know today in the form of the Colt 601, with its full name being a Colt Armalite AR-15 Model 001. Let's go into depth about this gun, just so we can understand how it would develop later. Going opposite of Grantham from butt to tip, the polymer furniture on the 601 was green, and the fixed stock had an underside metal sling mount. The controls on the receiver were different than they are today with no forward assist, a smaller bolt lock portion on the bolt control, and no fencing around the mag release to protect it from accidentally being pushed. The 20 round magazines were waffle shaped, like the Armalite style beforehand. The pistol grip, also a plastic, was brown and didn't have any finger grooves. The safety control was the same as it is today, but earlier versions of the rifle had safe in the upright position and full auto in the forward, which actually caused an accidental discharge with a tester who was crawling with the weapon in early trials before the gun went to Colt. Uh, anyway, the front takedown pin was also not captured, going along with the lack of fencing. On the top of the gun, the early trigger style charging handle was replaced by a rear style handle, which was smaller and more angular than today. In front of this was of course the carrying handle, which had a simple adjustable rear sight. Beyond this, the slip ring was flat in profile, the rifle had a 20 inch 1 in 14 twist pencil profile barrel with a three prong flash hider on it, allowing the 223 round to reach a muzzle velocity of around 3,000 feet per second. A fixed triangular front sight and bayonet lug came in front of the triangular handguard, which contained the famous gas system that has largely remained unchanged to this day. When the rifle is fired, gas is siphoned off from behind the bullet through the gas tube. The tube feeds back into the signature bolt carrier group, which reciprocates back into the stock through a buffer tube system. The bolt carrier group comes back into place, and the seven lug bolt rotates and locks into place, preventing gas from escaping the gun and ensuring a secure and tight fit in the chamber. So, how did this gun get adopted by the military? Well, it's actually kind of an interesting story, it's not so straightforward. As we went over last time, the US had briefly toyed with the idea of an intermediate caliber rifle, which is why the AR-15 was actually initially created, but ultimately the US Army pushed ahead with the M14. By this point, the Army was also interested in creating a SPEW, special purpose individual weapon system, 
which pretty much was supposed to have grenade launchers and flechette bullets and massively increased lethality and hit probability. But across the world, Robert McDonald, who was part of the sales company that brokered the deal between Armala and Colt, was actually touring the AR-10 and Colt 601 AR-15 rifles around East Asia to various militaries to try and sell the newly improved rifle, now backed by a popular brand name. McDonald showed both rifles to these militaries, but started to notice that the AR-15 was way more popular than its larger predecessor, especially in Asian countries like Vietnam and Korea, where the caliber was easier to handle for the smaller people. By the end of the tour, McDonald had stopped showing the AR-10 entirely since no one even wanted it, and he reported back to Colt that the AR-15 was a real winner among militaries. He even managed to sell some to Malaya in 1959. At about the same time, a based Air Force General, Curtis LeMay, had a birthday party where an AR-15 managed to make an appearance because he was the Chad type who liked to shoot guns on his birthday. LeMay shot the gun at some watermelons and they exploded, which he thought was very impressive and he was thoroughly impressed with its power despite its lightweight and controllable recoil and soon after, he actually formally put in a request to obtain AR-15s as the rifle for the US Air Force. Meanwhile, in the Army, things weren't going so well gun-wise. The M14 wasn't working very well in Vietnam, and production of the gun had run into snags. At the same time, the AR-15, now under Colt's brand name, had been positively reviewed by the Air Force as well as some of America's Far East allies, including the South Vietnamese. Plus, the army was convinced that the spew weapon system was the future, so they were starting to wane on their decision to use the M14 for long. But the army needed rifles to fill the production gap between the M14, which was having lots of issues with production, and the spew systems. So in 1963, they decided to start officially testing the AR-15, along with the Air Force. This produced two guns, the Colt models 602 and 603. The 602, which was favored by the Air Force, was largely similar to the original 601, but it had a wider, less angled charging handle like the ones we know today, a stronger three-prong flash hider, and a faster 1 in 12 twist rate on the barrel, making the round more stable. Other minor changes included a rubber-coated sling swivel, a better bolt release, a slightly smaller firing pin to avoid slam firing, and a linearly stamped magazine. The 603 was virtually identical to this, but it featured partial fencing on the receiver and a captured takedown pin, later as well a birdcage flash hider, and of course a teardrop-shaped forward assist. That's a whole other debate I won't get into, but the Air Force as well as Stoner didn't think the forward assist was necessary, but the Army wanted it anyway. The Army designated the 603 the XM16E1, and I want to take a quick minute here just to talk about the naming conventions. From here on out, many of these rifles will have at least two names, their factory Colt designation and their military designation. The Colt model designation will be a three-digit number, usually starting in the 600s like the 601 or the 603, but when the military adopts these weapons, they give it a new designation. The 603 was called the XM16E1 by the Army, and the 604, which was similar to the 602, was adopted by the Air Force as the M16. But these are the same gun. The 603 is the XM16E1, and the 604 is the M16. This will get a bit complex, so I'll list both names in the video, and you can just choose whichever is you like. So by 1964, the Air Force was satisfied with the gun and adopted the 604, which had some slight changes from the 602 with partial and then later full fencing and a birdcage flash hider, but was otherwise the same. This was designated the M16, as we just said. The Army, however, took a bit longer to decide on their gun, but eventually in 1967, pretty much gave up on the M14 and adopted the 603 as its official standard issue rifle, 
now renaming it the M16A1 and adding the changes of full fencing around the mag release. And yes, the 603 is complicated, it actually has three different names, a cult name, a military testing name with the X, and a standard issue name. The 603 is the XM16E1 and the M16A1, except the A1 has fencing, and the later A1s actually have a birdcage flash hider, but these changes were so small they didn't get their own models. But there was a big problem. The M16A1, in an effort to save money by the army, didn't have chromium plating in the chamber or bolt, unlike earlier versions. In Vietnam, with its moist and humid climate, plus a lack of cleaning procedure and fouling ammo powder, made the gun notoriously unreliable. Fortunately, these problems were mostly fixed within a year or so, and the gun did very well. Certain changes were made to the M16A1 over time to make it a better rifle, but none of these changes actually made a new rifle, as we just said. This is all the 603 just upgraded. Chromium lining was the first order of business, and in 1970, a compartment in the buttstock was added to house a cleaning kit, and the rifles were fitted with higher capacity 30 round magazines. Again, this is all still the 603. At the same time the M16A1 was being fielded, another variant of the rifle was coming into use in a different capacity, the 606. The 606 rifles are H-bars or heavily barreled assault rifles. As the name suggests, these rifles had heavier barrels so as to handle heat from continuous fire better. H-bars were used as light machine guns, similar to the BAR or RPK, and often were equipped with M60 bipods. You'll notice I said 606 rifles, and that's because there are actually three 606s. The 606, the 606A, and the 606B. The 606, aside from the barrel and bipod, was identical to the 602 with no forward assist, three-pronged flash hider, and forward fencing. The 606A was this with a forward assist and the 606B had a three round burst mode in addition to full auto and a forward assist. Later, the Colt 621 would be used as well, but it would be patterned off of the M16A1 or the late 603 rifles. These early M16s and their H-bar counterparts were standard issue in the US Armed Forces for quite some time until the Army wanted an upgrade. Colt obliged, and in 1981 Colt provided the Model 645, which was initially called the XM16A1E1 by the Army because Yes, this rifle, which would later become the M16A2 when it was fully issued the next year, had some small yet important improvements to its A1 predecessor. The barrel was changed to be a faster 1 in 7 twist, and after the front sight post, the barrel became thicker, a change that many saw as controversial and unnecessary, but was thought to make the gun more rugged by the Marine Corps. A rounded handguard, which had been tried briefly in earlier models, was added, and the flash hider was changed so that ports were only along the top so as to fight muzzle climb. The rear sight was changed to have different dials and was adjustable for elevation as well as windage, and of course the carrying handle was changed slightly to accommodate that. A longer buttstock was added, the forward assist button was made circular, a finger ridge was added to the grip, the slip ring was flared and a shell deflector was added. The most notable change, however, was the three round burst function that replaced the full auto on the previous A1. It's also worth noting that at this point the armed forces had standardized around the forward assist and M16 variants without it were not produced anymore. On the H-bar front, the Model 741 was pretty much identical to the A2 with a heavier barrel across the entire profile and bipod. The Model 737 also allegedly was the same, but with A1 style sights. But past a couple websites that referenced each other, I couldn't find any pictures or evidence of it existing. 
Since some of the A2 changes were controversial, many export versions of the gun had some small changes which we'll quickly look at here. The 701 was a full auto version of the A2, the 702 was full auto and had A1 sights for the United Arab Emirates, the 703 also for the UAE had auto and an M1 barrel profile, the 707 just had the M1 barrel and the 711 had the M1 barrel and sights. And while these are export versions, I am putting them in this video because they were still produced domestically by Colt and they were actually slightly different than the A2 and were not clone guns. Following in the complicated footsteps, we have the M16A3, originally designated the XM16A2E1. Sometime in the early 90s, we don't actually know when, for some reason, the M16A3 was issued in small numbers to the Navy. The A3, designated by Colt as the 901, is identical to the A2 except that it has full auto capability. Not too long after, the rest of the military got an upgrade and in 1997, the Colt Model 945 was adopted as the M16A4. The last of the M16 family, the A4 had two main changes in the name of modularity. On the top of the gun, the carrying handle became detachable with a Picatinny rail running underneath it. On the front of the gun, the handguard turned into a Knight's Armament quad rail that also held zero, allowing for mounting lasers, lights, and grips. Other than that, the gun was identical to the A2 with a three round burst, A2 barrel profile, also called government profile, and same butt stock. So that's it for the Colt rifles. As you can see, most of the complexity was in the beginning of the process where all the little changes were still being made, and after that, things got much more uniform. The Air Force and Army stopped fighting over the forward assist, and by the time of the A4, H-bars had gone out of style. There are obviously many skipped numbers in the sequence that you'll notice, and a lot of that is either because of export guns, which were identical to their domestic counterparts, or carbines, which we'll cover in the next video. If you're curious about what my exact criteria are for guns in these videos, go ahead and check out my last video. I go over my criteria real quick. Uh, but that's it for this video, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. I am sure that I missed some stuff and got some details wrong, so feel free to provide me with sources for where we can all learn more in the comments, and I will pin those and we can hopefully have a useful conversation. I will also have in the description some sources I have used for looking at the cult models. Anyways, hope everyone enjoyed. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And I will see you in the next one. Have a great day. Goodbye.